Hey everyone and welcome to today's panel hosted by Stamp the Wax in partnership with We Out Here. Today we're going to be exploring the politics of black joy on the dance floor and how this is communicated through the self-expression and identity of the DJ, the music plays and the relationship with the crowd and how political and socio-economic factors play the part in this. My name is Lou Jasmine and I'm a photographer, director um, and I love documenting music and culture. I'm especially passionate about documenting black joy and the black experience in spaces that we are not usually allowed to exist in. Today I'm joined by the legendary DJ Paulette, who has had a career spanning almost three decades as a DJ and radio host, as well as being the first female resident at the Hacienda. She's held several residencies over the years, including long-standing stints at the parties like Flesh and Homo Electric. Alongside DJing, Paulette helps to inspire a new generation through youth work, activism, mentoring, and radio and DJ workshops. I'm also joined by DJ and radio broadcaster, DJ Fly, a pioneering figure in drum and bass who has held residencies at seminal nights like Metalheads and Swerve. Her influential radio show, The Next Chapter, began as a weekly fixture on BBC One Extra when the station first launched, before taking the show on to Rinse FM. Now she works as a producer for award-winning charity Prison Radio Association, who run the world's only national station for prisoners as a way of reducing reoffending through the power of radio. So, ladies, over to you. Hello. Paulette, I'll let you go first. <laughs> You go first, right? <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, I'm a club and radio DJ. Um, I've run a label before. Um, I've released music that I produced, not really that many tunes over the years, but um, I used to have a partnership with Breakage years ago, we released some tunes under the name Alias. Alias, Alias. Um, yeah, I've done quite a lot over the years. Um, I've been with the PRA, Prism Radio Association, for the last seven years now, working there as a broadcast, um, a producer, sorry, uh, usually based in HMP Brixton. We've got a little studio set up there, two studios, like a classroom space, um, where the men we employ serve in prisoners uh, to work with us and train them up how to make radio. And uh, yeah, still DJing. I'm a co-founder of EQ50, which is a collective of women in drum and bass trying to encourage and affect change, trying to encourage more women to get involved and trying to um, correct the gender imbalance. And we've just launched our first ever mentorship programme, working with five established labels. So it's, yeah, it's all really busy at the moment, but exciting. Fantastic, fantastic. Love that, absolutely love it. Um, Paulette, over to you. Excellent. Well, um, like you said, I've been in the game nearly 30 years which is a bit scary because it means that literally I've seen probably two or three generations passing through clubs in the time that I've been de DJing. And um, in fact, next year, the, the party that I was resident for at the Hacienda will celebrate its 30th anniversary. So, um, you know, I said to them, you know, some of the people that we want to come to the party weren't even born when we started. So, you know, it's all very levelling when you put it in those, those terms. And um, in that time, in those 30 years, of course, I was a resident at the Hacienda for four years. And then I moved to London and I um, was a resident for Ministry of Sound International Tours. I played at the Saturday nights there. I played at probably, if not every club in London, Fabric. Um, ministry, The Cross, Bagley's, The Egg, all of them. Um, and I did that over nearly 10 years. I played for Faith, I played for Sunday Sonic, Soul Solid Sonic, Stuart Patterson, all the, all the big sort of house parties, um, Vertigo. And I toured internationally for the Ministry of Sound as well. So I covered most of Europe, I toured India, Argentina, South America, that kind of thing. And then I moved to France in 2004 and I DJed there for, again, nearly 10 years and I had possibly the biggest success um, to a level of getting like um, 
police escorts through the street, that kind of thing. And wow, thank <laughs> <laughs> like you. Okay, <laughs> like playing with A list DJs like David Guetta, um, Bob Sinclair, Martin Solvig, they were all on my sort of um, you know, I was on their posters, I was you know, I was the little one on the roster. And um, I stayed in France for nearly 10 years. Uh, I worked for Radio FJ there. Um, so I had a weekly radio show for nine years. And I um, had residences in most of the big club, queen club, red light, mix, mix club. And I toured all of France. And then in 2013, I decided to leave and um, go and export explore what it would be like to DJ in Ibiza so I stayed there for two and a bit years and it wasn't quite what I thought it would be but I learned an awful lot um, I managed to keep the joy and I moved back to Manchester which is my hometown in 2015 because my mum was ill and um, I came back had a real reassessment of my career and I thought I didn't know whether I was going to continue or change or you know, but as Freud says, the repressed will always return. So, um, you know, I took two years out looking after my mum being primary carer and doing various other bits and pieces, exhibitions and stuff like that. And then the DJing started coming again and it started very slowly and then it kind of gathered momentum. And now I'm here um, with We Out Here and Worldwide FM and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, fantastic <laughs> brilliant fantastic I forgot, bit, I forgot the bit about working for record labels as well but we're just talking about DJing, so. we can get on to that we've got time we've got time <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um yeah. what i what I, I suppose we can kick off with then is um you kind of touched upon it just there in your um in your intro is um is joy um but the term i suppose you know black joy is you know, being quite, you know, coined, I suppose, in the last yeah. few years. Um, and it's, I would say, something that I'm, I'm incredibly passionate about, um, about documenting that and about showcasing that um, during the, uh, you know, what tragically happened to George mm -hmm. Floyd. Um, that was my way of kind of expressing my emotion through that was um, I created uh, a highlight on my Instagram just with all things that could bring black joy um, we see enough black trauma so I thought for anyone who needed a bit of um, just you know a bit of respite from the trauma on the timeline you know I just gathered as much as I could um, from Instagram and reposted and celebrated us as black people that's what I know how to do um, but you know before that that you know it's, it's definitely a thing black joy and what I want to what I'd love to kick off with is is ask you both is obviously having you, you both have had, you know, incredible careers that desire I guess to uh, incite black joy and and bring it out has that always been around can I go first <laughs> Go for it. Well, it. Well, <laughs> and I want to do Go it on mute. It. I'll mute myself as well when you talk so that there's no. Okay. okay. Well, um, I've always been that little kid that wants to entertain. From being like seven years old, I used to do shows on the step outside the windows we have these french windows in our living room and my sisters are doing, i've got i'm the youngest of eight so my sisters and my brothers would all be like watching tv in the sitting room and i'd be in the garden on the step pretending that the step was a stage and i'd be like jumping on and off the step and singing and dancing and they'd be ignoring me and shutting the curtains and i would be like yeah. No, this is my show. And I always wanted to do some kind of show and entertain people. And then I was taught to play the violin and the piano. And even though I did those really well, it just wasn't my vibe. You know, I just wasn't feeling it. But I still, you know, was in the choir, in the orchestra, all the way through school, there was this kind of need to entertain. And then I started clubbing and, and then I discovered my um, absolute 
joy of dancing to music. I didn't have to be, I realized that I didn't have to be really drunk or off my head to enjoy being in a club and to enjoy dancing with other people and passing that joy on. And I absolutely buzz off dancing in a club and then finding someone that you can dance with and then two people are dancing and then three people are in the dance and then four people are in the dance and it just really spreads it's kinetic and I've always got something from that now there's a little bit of a um you know with every um you know with every light there's a little grain of darkness in it and sometimes you know i was aware because i was brought up in a very white irish area i was very aware that sometimes when black people are, are dancing it could be almost novelty you know oh look the black people are dancing and you know they clap they sing they do this they twirl you know and there, there was that kind of little tightrope in between enjoying myself and and being um a bit of the ridiculous entertainment for people so I, that i was always having to growing up i was always having to find that balance for myself between enjoying myself and being made a bit of a you know being made a bit of a fool of and then the older i got the more confident i got at, at actually encouraging other people to come on this little journey with me and i didn't start dj until quite late in life but when i started playing records then there was that moment where it was like a magic trick that i realized i could make people do that and not in any malicious sort of way but i just always feel when i'm playing music a bit like the pied piper it's just like come on this little journey with me let's have an absolute hoot let's like listen to music for two hours three hours four hours you know as long as i'm playing and just dance our asses off and have a really good time and i am also really into lip syncing <laughs> I to any record you like I'll make up the words if I don't know them. I really don't care. It just, just that joy of being in the dance, being in the music, letting all the notes just move through my body and watching people's faces transform as the same things happening to them. And that's been my, really my evolution through, through music is just actually really finding my identity through music and then passing that on and sharing it because there's one thing about music it's the most beautiful thing to share because everyone understands it we're all speaking the same language you know you don't have to know the words the tune is always the same in every language the tune is always the same so that that sharing that's my black joy and dancing and sharing it and passing it on and singing it and you know maybe a little fist bump every now and again you know it's dope <laughs> it is it's just magical magical and that's that's what i feel anyway yeah amazing so for you then so black joy for you is being able to pass on the joy that you feel from the music that you're Absolutely. passionate about and 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 does it matter if the black joy if you're the joy you're passing on to is to other black people or is it just for you is it just two people no it's for everybody i am black white chinese jewish gay straight female male everyone whoever feels it with me you know even even sometimes when i'm walking my sister's dog in the park i'll be speaking <laughs> to the dog and the dog will respond to certain songs you know? i guess in that respect then 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 you are the black joy so you're the thing that then when people want to see black joy they look at you yeah man you know, that's that you're like, the thing i'm the one i'm the entertainment the entertainment's arrived but not in a big <laughs> egotistical way no. just like that's what i want to bring to every party however if you see me with a face on me and it's not going right uh you'll know that something's really wrong because generally my thing is to bring the joy and if the joy isn't there there's something really happening <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Uh, to watch not being able to bring the joy every 365 days <laughs> yeah. can't be every day can't have joy every day can't, every day. <laughs> can't do every day you need a day off you need a day you need what just one just one, just one day. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, and uh and fly then so for yes. you in terms of black joy then and, and what that kind of means to you and has meant to you over the years um especially now what would you say how would you say um, I guess I, ca I come from a different perspective than Paulette and I can understand all of that but I'm much more of I don't know introvert but I'm quite a shy person and um, very easy going but I prefer to observe what's going on rather than be in the center of attention like I don't really like telling jokes. I'm not good at telling stories or anything like that, but give me some music and I will tell you a story with music. I will create a film kind of thing, but soundscapes and that's me expressing myself through music. Um, I guess I found myself, probably found myself on the dance floor as Paulette did. Um, I think going to my first big jungle raves. So I used to go to an under 18s night when I was like 14, 15 in Streatham and it was on Sundays, afternoon into the evening. It was called Club 2000. And uh, they used to play hardcore breakbeat. Um, SL2 was special guests one week. The club was absolutely rammed. Um, who else did I see? Praga Khan was supposed to play one week, um, but they missed their flight. So they got Aphex Twin to DJ and I don't think anybody really knew who he was because we were like teenagers. <laughs> so we were like, oh, who's that? We wanted to hear Praga Khan. Um, and he started DJing. Unfortunately, he cleared the dance floor because it was quite heavy. But I just remember like, just really going for it dancing as much as my self-consciousness would allow me to go for it. Um, and just completely getting lost in the music and the speakers and being around friends and closing my eyes and stuff. And I guess that carried through to a couple of years later when I went to my first big ticketed rave when I was 16, just after I'd finished my GCSE, GCSEs. Um, yeah, and I thought, wow, this, this is for me, loads of different types of people around. Um, obviously, yeah, qu quite a lot of black people. Um, I think it's fair to say the drum and bass has become very white over the years and more recently. Um, so, I, I felt completely comfortable and at ease then. Um, so yeah, I became a raver and then started buying records a little bit later in my late teens and started learning to DJ. But um, yeah, Black Joy, um, in this moment, I'll probably have to think about that a little bit, but I guess it's just focusing as much as you can on yourself, what, what brings yourself joy, what pleases you, um, looking after yourself mentally and physically and just being close to those that you hold dear. Um, there aren't any clubs at the moment so I've kind of lost that form of expression for myself. Um, I've only done a couple of live streams during, the, during this lockdown quarantine period and they've both been in clubs luckily so um, that felt that actually felt amazing just to be back in a club environment on loud speakers um yeah yeah and i guess just 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 um channeling my energy into the other projects that i've got going on so i've i wasn't furloughed so i've been working from home every day um but part of my job i just produced a podcast series called windrush stories so to work oh, on that wow. and hearing all these stories from like I spoke to Diane Abbott and Benjamin Zephaniah, my dad's in there, um, various people, um, which was incredible as well, but also really heavy, just being reminded of these stories and how poorly people from the Caribbean were treated when they first came here, still are. Um, and with the whole George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, civil rights uprising globally, our big arguments going on in drum and bass at the moment, whether the music is black or white. <laughs> it's it's black. it's felt very heavy, <laughs> very very yeah. heavy at times. Yeah. But but the, I think it's yeah it's the music. Music has kept me going. There's a lot of great music around at the moment. So fantastic. And how? Yeah, I, um, it's like, it's, oh sorry, Paula. Well, I would like to jump in because 
just the basic and fundamental um the fundamental parts of black joy for me is you know my mum was a jazz singer so i always say like everyone from my family came from music music is the absolute ground zero so i mean even in african terms and the slaves in the south it's it's the drum mm -hmm. and it, it's the rhythm of the drum yeah, it's yeah, yeah. so many messages your first drum the first drum you'll ever hear is the heartbeat and the pulse it's the first drum you'll hear and if you for me that reaction to music and the beats and music it's all based around that it really yeah. is that's yeah, where yeah. my joy is that's where my joy comes from and that's why i will always return to music it's got me through some of the darkest darkest corners of life because there is a joy in that there is a security in that and i just get such an amount of pleasure and nourishment and 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 just um it's like an island of calm and peace mm. as well yeah 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 no, I, yeah, yeah it's to totally yeah. a comfort a it's comfort a and a companion yeah. it's, it's a real there. friend that i think i would say you know even you know i've been through so many relationships but my relationship with music is the number one mm -hmm. And it's not the gospel. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah serious, serious. It's the one that matters. <laughs> one hundred percent. I'm, you know, exactly the same as you. Music, for me, has. I mean, it's been there since I was from birth. You know, I, my mum encouraged me always to record music from the radio. You know, just pushing that. Recording, you're like, okay, wait, stop yes. before, before the DJ says something. Yeah. Yeah. So you can create some of these little mixtapes to, um, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> click that, he's done, he's done, and you know, and, and also going through records when I was a kid and looking at, you know, production and you know, looking at all the small texts and things like that, and obviously music isn't as as visceral now you know it isn't as um tangible in terms of you know people can stream it pretty easily so there's there's the removal from it um but what seems to have always stayed especially within the many different black cultures that we have you know black people we're not a monolith you know we're all different and from different parts but the thing that i think connects us always is music and joy mm -hmm. And there's that, and that's been a really interesting um, thing to, you know, kind of growing up and being part of cultures, especially music cultures, who which were mostly navigated through more white, in more white spaces and through more white people, you know, having grown up around punk and alternative music and grunge and then kind of going into the electronic music which I, I you know whenever you see the other black girl black girl you're like oh hey yeah man i would <laughs> you know, yeah, I would yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, yeah and then seeing the way that you know you kind of free yourself on the dance floor you're not even yeah. thinking about your dance the music and then all these white people are like oh my god like oh you're cheering, <laughs> you know and you're like I'm just doing my thing here yeah. but there is there is that thing i think that a freeness that we bring to the dance floor as, as black people from any country, any mm. background or, you know, denomination or, or class or, um, you know, anything. We, 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 start, we hear any type of music that, that we enjoy and, and it's like, it lives through us. Yes. And, you know, and we're there yeah. and we're just doing our thing and you're just like, you know. Um, for me, having kind of, you know, being in those spaces where, you know, when it comes to my generation, even I think the music before was probably occupied mostly by black people, is now mostly by white people. Um, and I would, that, you know, kind of, it would always play in the back of my mind, but I'm there for the music. I'm there to experience that joy. Um, however, there is the conversation that's just happening a lot more now, which I'm really happy about. But the fact is that electronic music, is, has actually evolved to be the thing it is now in terms of the spaces being occupied by more white people. 
it didn't actually start that way. And yeah. so seeing black men and black women on a bill where everyone be like, oh my God, isn't that amazing and super progressive? And you saw like the like, one, you're like, actually, no, we're going the other way. <laughs> used to, exactly. Yeah. It used to be uh, mostly. Yeah, mostly. Right. Not tough it. So, yeah, so know the history. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in that context then for you both, how has it been for you in terms of, you know, you're both, you both expressed that how you found yourselves through music, through the dance floor. Um, how has it been then watching the dance floor change in that way? So going from seeing that, like you're giving joy to people and then, you know, the people who kind of look like you as well, but then seeing less and less and less of people mm -hmm. who do look like mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. how, how have you both navigated that as pioneers in the industry? Um, I guess, I guess you just have to get on with it in the moment. Um, and it's not really, it's something that I've noticed for a long time in drum and bass. Um, particularly if I'm playing in Europe or elsewhere abroad. Um, you notice when there's a couple of black people in the club. And so I always kind of home in on them and I'm like, okay, I'm playing some tunes for you now. And as soon as I see them get down dancing, I'm like, okay, I'm all right. I'm, I can carry on this line, this thread, this theme that I'm playing and I'm cool. Um, but yeah, in terms of UK clubs, I don't know, I think being completely frank, I've felt a certain sense of resentment building, but that's purely because I know that big labels and platforms aren't doing what they should be in terms of keeping pe newcomers and new ravers informed as to the roots of the music, where it comes from, how it evolved, who did what, who built this uh, platform, this amazing scene industry for the younger people to, to be enjoying now um, and in recent times. So yeah, it's something that quite a few of us have been talking about within drum and bass circles, like DJs and artists and that. Um, I mean, there's not really anything, when the music becomes more popular, we, we live in a white dominated, uh, predominantly white country anyway. So when something becomes popular, it's always, there's always going to be more white people um, listening, going out to it. Um, so that's kind of a given, but yeah, it is quite frustrating when things are kind of lauded as being original and new when actually no people were doing that 10, 15, 20 years ago. They're just not being the, given being given the coverage now, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. to do. I think it's also to do with um, musically. Um, you know, a lot of music it goes through cycles, and yeah. you've got samples coming through and samples coming through, and they're like people using, particularly in house music, people using the same voices over and over again, but it gets lost whose voice that is. Yeah. yeah, yeah so you'll hear in, in the 90s, someone had sampled, you know, like Black Box sampled Lolita Holloway and they got their ass kicked for it and they had to say it was Lolita Holloway and they had to say that we are using a model to front this voice. But since then, Lolita Holloway's voice has been used on possibly hundreds of records mm. and hardly anyone now knows who that person is, mm. unless they're like 30, you know, maybe 35 to 50, and they'll go, oh yeah, that's yeah, from yeah, that that's track. So they're really not, I think one of the one of the reasons that this is the 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 whitewash is happening or the erasure is happening is because they are not giving people the credit that they should be giving mm. the credit. And the same, you know, with house music, it started in the black gay clubs, but it's not black and gay anymore. You'd be no. hard pressed to find the original crowd, you know, the, the, the original vibe for house music, like Ron Hardy, like yeah. Frankie Knuckles, Larry yeah. Heard. So, you know, these, these are the people, you know, Marshall Jefferson, these are the cornerstones of house music. Black, 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 mm. black. Derek Carter, you know, Roy Davis Jr., all the Americans, mm -hmm. 
before you even get to the UK. And then when he starts to talk about the, the, the black DJs in the UK that, that had something to do with the scene, they're not written about, they're not talked about. So that's why, you know, there's a little, there's a little disconnect. And, um, and also they kind of get shoved to one side and, you know, the poster boys become like your Calvin Harris or yeah. David yeah. Getter or, you know, all of a sudden it becomes something, something that they can package in books that will sell to a lot more people. And that's not saying it's particularly malicious, it's just business. Yeah. So somehow it's easier to sell um, a record made by a East London 18 year old fresh squeaky clean white kid who samples Lolita Holloway than a 45 year old black guy who is the person that created that beat. Yeah. On yeah, a yeah. Record. The and, interesting, yeah. I was gonna yeah. say, the interesting thing with that though is that I feel like that's what they've told us because actually when you look at things that are marketed with black people, look at the film, look what Black Panther did, broke all the records. Well, we break records. True, we can, you know, we, can sell. We, we sell out, we sell out and we break records, but they tell us that we can't. Um, yeah. And so it's been this thing in society, in society where you, you, you know, it, it, we, they go, oh, well, you know, we, yeah, we, need, we need this 18 year old, or we need this, you know, like, yeah. Well, actually, no, because no, you, you alien, you alienate, you alienate them, a whole group of people. Because yes, you're getting a thousand people, two thousand, three thousand people going to see this squeaky clean eighteen-year-old. But actually, you could have ten thousand yeah. people coming to see Absolutely. this. You know, if Absolutely. because you'd have both. You know, you'll you have both scenes. So I feel like the conversation, the discourse around it, needs to change. The the, the the vocabulary needs to change the phrasing this year we need to start saying well actually let's we need to put her on the bill we need to start questioning these promoters and these bookers and say when they say you know well actually if i put a 45 year old black woman on the bill it won't sell i'll be like okay so sorry show me the proof because i tell you what happened i tell you what happened so when that, that didn't happen because i'd be i really want to know yeah. you know give me a five in between the now and the last five years show me when that happened because last time I checked, Beyonce sold out everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's very interesting the thing that happens. I was played at Park Life not last year, last year, and um, I was playing in a VIP, not one of the big tents. And I started to play, and the crowd was almost entirely, you know, young white kids. It was fine. The place was bouncing, and then all of a sudden, this crew. A really beautiful, like cyberpunk, um, really beautifully turned out black mixed race people of color, like this group of like 20 people just bounced in and took over the front and went, no, we're not having this. We're not hearing these six sounds without you having some sisters and brothers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And that place just completely transformed because it changed from a vibe of people just <laughs> judging, you know, one step forward, two step back to yeah. this dance, you know, we had dancing happen and I was so happy and I put all the films on, on Instagram because it was just a total moment for me because I was beginning to lose faith that, you know, maybe people were losing the knack of dancing in clubs. Mm. Like dancing. Yeah, I felt that yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, I really yeah. felt that. I don't know if you had that as well. And they can only dance for like 30 seconds and then they go <laughs> We used to do this for like the whole night. <laughs> yeah. to the track, you know, and then go into another and be drenched in sweat. You know, the, the people don't work up a sweat anymore. So for this particular moment, when it happened in part life, I was like, oh God, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. Because that's what we do it for. Yeah. That's why yeah. we play. That's the yeah. joy, you know, it's like kinetic and it was beautiful. And yeah, yeah, it really was. Um, and that's, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. That's the, yeah, that's what I, I, Every time I hit the dance floor, that's what I'm hoping to see. But I, I definitely have, especially over the last few years, you know, I, I, you know, lo I love music. And like you were saying before, um, 
I could I could rave all night to six a.m. with just water, you know, yeah. happily. Don't get me wrong, I love a drink, but right. you know, <laughs> I, the music it's just for me. I'm I'm here for the music, and that will keep me going, you know. Um, but there have been definitely times where you feel like, where where is the joy? Yeah. And yeah. it's not just the trudging and the, you know, yeah. where is where is the mute? Where where's your yeah. arms and where's your the body? Flair? Where is it? Why? Where is the emotion? Where's the passion? Where's the feeling of it? Yeah. Um, and, and, and electronic music really does that, you know. It's not it's not exactly music which just bypasses you, you know. Mm. Yeah, because it's kind of interesting because some people, you know, to do, I I am the same whether I dance to drum and bass or disco or R and mm. or house, you know, I if I hear that beat that gets me, I'm gone. You know, I'm all levels. I'm down. I'm up. I'm shouting. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just in the back. But my family are a bit like that. When, when we dance, we're like that. And then we're all like really shy and reserved. In, in, if you can believe that. But, you know, actually, <laughs> in real life, I don't, you know, I can, you know, people will almost think I'm a bit moody when I'm in a club, but then I'll hear a tune and then I'm someone totally different. And I just always love seeing other people that can do that. I just yeah. really appreciate it. You know, just seeing someone, you know, you can just see it when you're playing and you'll see a little toe tap. And then you'll see a little, you know, a little, <laughs> a little something. Yeah, it's like okay, like, oh, I'm like, oh, here we go, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got someone to work on here, and you just like yeah. keep tweaking it until it's like mm. hey, the shoulders are going now. I've got there. It. Go. It's like oh, <laughs> <laughs> and what? And the thing is, and then they become infectious to the people yes, on the floor like, as well, because then they're going for it. People are like, oh, maybe should we? Should we be going for that? Oh, you know, let's, 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 they they know how to have fun. Let's go. Through. With yeah, that. Mm. yeah and the fun, fun. Um, it doesn't matter what you play, whether you're playing, you know, like absolute tearing drum and bass, which you'll know where there'll there'll be a point where you will hit a scene which is just full on, mm. and just keeping people in that moment, that that throb is gorgeous mm. it's gorgeous and, and having that skill is something really special yeah 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 and definitely. actually that leads me on that leads me on to my next question actually <coughs> about about fun um how how do you think fun is quantified or you know evaluated within the kind of club environment i think that that follows on well from this discussion about the, the people losing themselves in the on the dance floor um and where you're not seeing people do that so much, I think um, people's idea of fun is coming from too many phone screens. Yes. So in Instagram, that. whether you. that's still shots, that's videos, fun. people are far more. Um, I don't want to gender. Well, I'm generalising, but I don't mean to. Um, <laughs> it seems like a lot of people were far more concerned with taking a few photos with their friends just to show that they've been somewhere rather than actually being in the moment with the DJ, with other people in the room, in the club, rave, festival, whatever it is, and actually feeling that moment properly rather than documenting it and then maybe looking back later because you're not, you're not going to get those vibes or feelings back. Absolutely. It's really important. So when you're, when you're somewhere, you need to be in that moment. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I've, yeah, I don't really take too many photos myself. Um, just feeling like something is missing from some dance floors. And I've definitely noticed that in the drum and bass mm -hmm. jungle world. Not not as much jungle nights per se, because you do get a lot of proper ravers and dancers. Yeah. But drum and bass um, and particular nights and clientele, you don't really see much movement on the dance floor. And I really miss it. Yeah. I really miss it. Just, and I think that's, part of the reason I became a DJ as well. Like I started off dancing all night and getting into it, but then I kind of became obsessed with watching other people DJ and watching their hands and seeing how they made people dance. And I thought, I want to do that as well. 
Yeah. So um, yeah, I do. I do miss seeing some proper moves being pulled off on the dance floor. But then, how do we get that back? Well, see, this is the question. question I was going to. I was just something okay. I was going to ask you actually is that do you? This might be a slightly controversial question. I don't know. We out here might cut this one out. But um, <laughs> <laughs> do you, um, this is the thing. This is, I'm drawing this from my own personal experience, and this is this is kind of how I feel about it. Have been feeling quietly about it over the last few years. But I feel that with the um, seeing less and less people of colour on the dance floor has stolen the joy. That's part of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. That that's not a huge, that's not all of it, but I mean, there's other reasons why I think it's happened, which I probably won't go into in terms of oh, oh, reviews oh. and stuff like that. But I feel like the, the people who are there are not, you know, like you were saying before, aren't necessarily always there for the music. Yeah. Um, they're there to kind of just docu quickly doc, not even document, just yeah. snap, I'm here. Boom, let's go to the bar. Um, but as you were saying, Paulette, you know, when brown people occupy the space, it it turns up. Yeah, mm. the heat turns up. And, mm. and, and with you know, and, and it's like I feel like we need to bring get we need to, we need to kind of bring that back. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'd like to take that point on because I, you know, one of the things I talk about to all of my friends who are either organizers of club nights or their managers of bars or clubs or everything is like what is happening on your door right now what's happening on your door because yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Why are we only getting this kind of person in who just wants to drink get really drunk maybe cause a bit vaggy and then you know leave and we're not actually getting the nice people that will have one or two drinks, but really want to hear the music and want to have a dance. Why aren't we getting those people? So it's a money thing in the first yeah. instance. Yeah. They yeah, want yeah. people who are going to come in and spend like 17 quid a cocktail all night, rather than people that are going to come in and spend, you know, 10 quid on two pints and stay all night but dance you know because dancing takes up space yes dancing takes up it, space yes it takes up people's space it takes up people's space at the bar if you've not got a dance floor it takes a people's space on the dance floor if you just want to pack your dance floor with people holding drinks and taking pictures so you know there's a bottom line which is really obvious which is very straightforward money like money um and on the second one it's you know, the second one is door policy because, you know, mm. certain people get in, certain people don't. Um, pricing, certain people have the money for it. Yeah, certain people don't. Don't. yeah. Um, you know, so if you're pricing your drinks at 17 quid a drink, uh, you know, you've got to earn a certain amount of money every week to be able to enjoy a night out that's going to cost you maybe 200 quid by the time you've paid your taxes and paid your drinks and had a meal, right. you know, which, yeah. you know, it, it, it's economics, simple, simple mm. economics, which are really killing the fun. And then on a practical level of killing the fun, phones, technology is just like my absolute bet noir. When in the 90s, we didn't all have cell phones. No. 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. Who had a phone? <laughs> no. <laughs> no one could Not even me. be bothered to get the phone <laughs> out of the bag to take a picture, you know. How many pictures have you got from, you know, even 2000, 2001, how many pictures have you got from that time? You know, it's yeah. like, oh my God, someone's actually got a picture of that party. You know? <laughs> and there was no Instagram, there was no Mixcloud, there was no Soundcloud, there was no YouTube. So if you went to a party, you were in the party. You were listening to the music because that's the only place you had to hear the music. There was only Radio One or Kiss, you know, or some pirates. Yeah. But pirates were sketchy at the beginning. So, <laughs> you know, if you wanted to hear new music, how long did it take them to put Fabio and Groove Rider on Radio One? It was what, 97, 98 before they got a show. Yeah, late 90s, yeah. 
Yeah, I didn't realise it was so late. Oh, you wanted I, to. I didn't realise. Yeah. You had to go to the raves. You had to go to the parties, <coughs> and you were writing down the tunes if you could see because they did the white label thing. So if you could see what they were playing, <laughs> you know, and then you had to find that tune. You know, Nicky Black Market. Mm -hmm. They you like you had to find the tunes. So it was like a real discovery. Clubs were like a library in the mm. late 90s in in into the early noughties you know that the clubs were the place that you heard the music because there wasn't anywhere else we only had four channels on tv <laughs> you, know, so <laughs> that, you know if you want to know why we enjoyed the parties there wasn't really a lot more <laughs> though for a minute yeah. and say though that with the with phones and people being able to take photos um, and social media that ha has that allowed because obviously you've had your own experience Paulette of being essentially written out of the history books you know oh, big time. yeah yeah and you fought hard for that you know to, to, to kind of get back in there be like hold it for a second no you know yeah hello I, I, I I'm one of the great examples here too um <laughs> And so social media though will be is you know helpful for that. And for instance, for oh, yeah, this, definitely. even this, you know, this is kind of going to go out. And you know, if you were playing, let's say that um, you know, let's say we were at We Out Here today, you know, and um, you know, someone was filming this and they put it up on their story and like, DJ Paulette Fly and DJ Flights, and you're like, Oh, well, I've never heard of DJ Fly and DJ Paula, but there are two yeah. black women here who are Absolutely. legendary DJs. And uh, you know, now I need to go and research them and stuff. So Absolutely. it gives us access yes, in that is. respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. However, I do understand. So it's, it's almost like how to find the balance. You know, obviously, there's, I don't know if you've both heard of Touching Bass, which, you know, they put on parties and they have a strict no phone on the dance floor yeah. policy. Um, they, you know, they're offline, you know, you you can't like book a ticket online or anything like that. It's it's an offline thing, and you you kind of text the number, and that's kind of how you can find out about it. Um, which is great, and they have really kind of built a you know real grassroots um, kind of party through that, and a grassroots following. So how do we find the balance then? You know, because it's important to, to for visibility is important for women like yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as we were talking about, you know, having been. Uh, the music has been whitewashed. H how do we find the balance of, of documenting, but also enjoying and celebrating mm. the music? Yeah. Yeah, the internet has obviously done wonders for a lot of, well, for music in general, because it's reached around the globe to people who don't have a local scene necessarily. They can still get into the music um, and they don't necessarily have to trek somewhere to go and hear it in a club. Although I still believe that is the ultimate beauty of hearing music on a big, on a good sound system, basically, and just feeling the atmosphere and being at one with the rest of the people in there. Um, but in terms of, yeah, documenting and making sure, actually talking about um, touching bass being offline, I was watching a talk online hosted by Scratcher, DVA and Alex Nutt. And, uh, KG and some others were on there and he mentioned about the wrong type of people coming to his party not not wrong but but just being online all the time and where people certain people are online all the time or have jobs where they're online they can get the tickets first and yeah. he started to keep some back so that his regulars who just come and rock up and pay on the door they would definitely get in as well so I think that could be something that a lot more promoters do rather than selling tickets online all the time, because then you are going to get a certain type of person who buys up, who can afford to buy the ticket straight away as soon as they're put on sale. You know, um, I think um, lineups as well. The look of your lineup dictates who your crowd is going to be. Absolutely, it does. Um, so that's another thing that a lot of people need to be seriously looking at. Um, for for drum and bass um a lot of every, everything's become label oriented so a lot of the biggest parties are run by labels the biggest labels are have majority white men they might have one black 
or a couple of black people, usually men as well, um, signed to their rosters. But yeah, so that's generally why you see a lot of mainly white crowds. Um, there's nowhere near enough support for black women mm-hmm. in drum and bass, um, which I feel like I've been talking about a lot recently, putting, yeah. sticking my neck out, putting my neck on the line. Same, um, same. Yeah, that's yeah. Same. Um, so yeah, that, that's something that people need to seriously be looking at. It's like, it's, it, it feels obvious to me. You would think it's common sense, like the more inclusive your organization is as a whole and the more different people you're putting on lineups, that's what your crowd is going to look like because they will see people will see others who look like them and they'll think, okay, I'll, I'll feel comfortable there. You know, they know that it's going to be a mixed, a mixed bag. You've totally nailed it there. You just said they will see others who look like them. I asked my sisters maybe, I think it might have been four or five weeks ago. And I was like, why do you not come to all of the parties that I play? And why have you not, come to the festivals and they're like there's nobody like us in the crowd and there's nobody that we like on the lineup other than you and I'm like well you know yeah. come for me and they're like yeah but there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing, nothing else. else for us on that lineup you know if yeah. it, if they change the lineup if they put something a little bit more soulful on there or they put something yeah. a little bit more jump up with a bit more energy on the lineup yeah we'd be there so you, yeah. I mean you just totally nailed it and it's even down to you know the staff that are serving the people that welcome you yeah. in on the door if yeah. you see people like you there you will go like yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. There, so this go. is why this is why I'm really passionate about documenting and about representation um you know it was a probably a few couple of months ago now during lockdown um so i i directed jayla g's music video uh, latest track both of us and um you know i was in her flat and we were just kind of dancing around to it because annie mac put it on the radio and stuff and i posted a clip of me and her dancing around the living room to it on my instagram and then kind of forgot about it and then looked back on my instagram the next, I think, much later that night and i was inundated with messages from black people saying we don't see this we have two black women dancing one of them has made the track and the other one directed the video for the track and it's electronic yeah. music we don't yeah, see yeah, this yeah. thank you thank you so much can you please yeah. keep doing this can you please yeah. keep and i was like well wow. i was like oh my god and i was like of course but to, you know to me i was just like i was just having fun with my friend you know but to to, to the people those people they were like oh I, I see yes there's someone else like me yeah there's mm. someone else and it's like you said, it's that representation which is so important to see that on the dance floor. And, you know, dance floors are political. You know, whether yeah. we're in you know, so, the actual living room or, you know, in a club, it, it, it is, it's, it's political in, in some way or another. Uh, and so then for, for, you know, for you both then, are there any, um, are there any DJs whose, whose joy has kind of stuck with you and, and kind of, inspired you to kind of loads 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 i mean um you know it from from all different angles really like i one of the first djs i ever really kind of warmed to in terms of how much energy they put out I remember seeing Carl Cox play in a really tiny club in London, like in the nineties, like Velvet, I think. And they were like- Oh, Velvet Room, I love that place. (laughs) And there must've been like 20 people there, but it didn't matter with Carl, it didn't matter whether he was playing to one person, 20 people or 20,000 the energy was always the same. So I'd always like follow Carl Cox and just thought he was brilliant. And then there's Norman Jay, who on the other side of it was just so in his music and it's soul, it's funk, it's disco, it's house. And he was like putting everything together and just in such a beautiful way. And he always made me dance. You know, I was, I'm always been influenced by DJs who've made me dance. And I remember seeing like, DJ Disciple play at Paradise Factory in Manchester. I think it was probably 93 or 94. 
and um, it was really packed gig and he's playing and the record started to jump because he's playing vinyl and he just uh, and this is when I was watching DJs like what is he doing with his hands how is he going to deal with this moment and the record was jumping and he just tapped the vinyl one two three times so you had a skip 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 and on the third one it just kicked into the groove and then <laughs> and I <laughs> have <that. laughs> I it. I've never forgotten it because you know any time that happens even now with like pioneer and you know if it hits the emergency loop like you're like how am i gonna get out of this how am i gonna get out of this and he was just so cool like he did not lose his stack and that i learned a massive lesson from that that's just like influence and then watching Frankie Knuckles play as many times as I saw him play beautiful Tony Humphreys playing beautiful Louis Vega is like uh, one of my absolute dons and then um Ron Trent and uh, Roy Davis Jr seeing them play I remember seeing the Martinez brothers play when they were like 18 years old in Miami oh, and it was so <laughs> special like knowing when you've seen someone play that they have that thing that is going to just send them stellar and it was beautiful to watch but then for the women that i've seen play princess julia honey dijon dj heather who i used to play you know they, these these are people that were playing for friends of mine like luke solomon and kenny hawks at space and they were amazing then you know honey dijon has earned her stripes for a very mm -hmm. long time you know what we're seeing now is like the culmination of 20 years of proper 20 odd years of proper graft you know she's like really if there's someone that i would say has absolutely learned their craft inside out and in the other other way has had a whole other journey that is equally as important then she is that person you know massive influence on me and then who else a big long list but how about oh and then drum and bass fabio and groove rider i went yeah, yeah. play so many times you know um speed at the milk bar was my absolute thursday night i was there every week my friend leo ryan ran it and like um, what was the one they had at the Blue Note as well? Metalhead Sunday Sessions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and Were you there? there? Every Are you DJing there? Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't DJing then. I, I think I. I first started going to Metalhead Sunday Sessions. I was like seventeen, yeah. maybe when I started going there, and it lasted for three years. And um, yeah, during that time, I started buying records and started DJing. Basically, it was seeing Chemistry and Storm. That yeah, Chemistry and Storm. The, the light, yeah. Play, uh, the light switch just went boom. I was like, okay, so I can do more than just design logos for my friends who are putting on their own <laughs> school parties or, yeah, work in PR or whatever. That was when I wanted to be a DJ. It was the first time I saw Kimmy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, other people like Fabio is one of my all-time inspirations. I still okay. love him to the bone. Yeah, yeah. I was always more into Fabio than oh, Bookham. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I still love watching Storm now. Um, she's still really passionate about it. But people like Brian G, like yeah, he's, yeah, for me, he's one of the yeah. nicest and most passionate people in drum and bass and jungle. Like he still loves it now as much as he yeah. did years ago. That's it. Um, wonderful. Because you feel the joy, don't you? You really do get that yeah. sense of, yeah, it's what keeps yeah. you up. Yeah. But then I'm really excited by, um, a lot of the younger women coming through, like Six Figure Gang, Sherelle, yes. Zia, Yazus, Jossie Mitsu. <laughs> Honestly, I love them so much. They're all, they're all amazing. And it inspires me. It gives me joy to see them doing so well. Um, because for quite a while, it felt like a, a real slog, you know, like not only being a woman in drum and bass, but being a black woman. Mm. And just that there have been so few... DJs and producers, um, it tended to be more vocalists, big up Jenna G, RIP Diane Charlemagne. Shouts to Chickaboo, she doesn't get anywhere near as 
many props as she should, the first woman jungle MC. Um, yeah, so there are quite a few women out there, um, but we just haven't been allowed to come right to the forefront Absolutely. of drum and bass and jungle. So yeah, seeing, seeing what they're doing, I think, wow, <laughs> it's amazing, it's incredible. Talk to us a little bit about how you started you so you talked to us about your influences um you know when you first went to sunday sessions at metalheads um, yeah. and that's when you start, first started buying records so tell us the journey from from then um so the reason i started going to sunday sessions metalheads was because i was already a number one fan of chemistry and storm um so after i first saw them at the old sw1 club in victoria that was opposite the station it's been called pasha and cube and loads of other stuff over the years i can't remember all the names um it was an innovation night i saw them they blew my head off with their selection they looked really stunning as well like obviously kemi with her bleached locks i was like wow <laughs> she kind of resembles family member or me kind of um but yeah they were playing completely different tunes to everybody else that night and initially when i saw them turn up walk up behind the decks i just thought they were raps mates rap dj rap was my favorite for a little while yeah. Um, but yeah, they were just completely different and just completely poised and the way they carried themselves, it was like really different to everybody else. Um, so I used to try and see them as much as I could at all their London gigs. And, uh, it turns out they did start calling me their number one fan. Oh, look, it's our number one fan <laughs> again. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, then while I was at college, I started buying the odd record because that was mainly the only way you could have the music, unless you were, like you were saying earlier, Paulette and Lou, both of you, like recording off pirate radio mm. um, or buying tape packs. I never really had enough money to buy tape packs from mm. raves. So um, yeah, I started buying the odd record and then learned how to mix a bit later. I actually started a documentary photography degree in South Wales, but I left after one term because I missed going out so much. I missed London. There was nothing to do. There was like one jungle night in the whole time I was in Newport. And by that point in London, I was going out like three, sometimes four times a week. There was always something on. Yeah, every day. Um, yeah, every day. yeah. So, um, yeah, so I came, came home, um, started learning how to mix properly. Couple of months of dust around for a little while. A couple of months later, started working in a record shop part time. My wages were ten pound a day plus free records. So I was like, okay, this is amazing. Like the money's crap, but <laughs> I'll get free vinyl out of it. Um, and then that led to because I was going out so much, I kind of knew a lot of people as well, and people recognised my face. So if I were going to black market, Ash Attack or whoever would just pull out a big pile of promos and give me them to listen to. I wasn't playing anywhere then I was literally buying one or two tunes to listen to at home um and then a few months after learning to mix and starting in the shop I started playing on Flex FM and would do the graveyard shift on like a maybe a Saturday night or a Friday night just playing from like 12 midnight or 1am till the early hours of the, the morning with my friend he brought me up there um and then it just went from there and later that year, so at the end of 97, when I first started mixing and playing on Pirate, I actually had my first gig as well. And that was purely from knowing, getting to know a woman who I used to see at Metalhead Sunday sessions. Um, her name was Emma. I haven't seen her in absolutely years. I hope she's all right. Um, and yeah, she hey, said, Emma. oh, I'm, it's, <laughs> it's my birthday party. I'm, I've hired out a wine bar in Soho. Do you want to come? She said, oh, I've booked Matrix. Matrix was one of my favourites. I was like, oh my God, amazing. She said, oh, but I'm wondering, I don't know, not sure who else to book. Do you know any DJs? I said, I DJ. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally like not even been a year at that point. And she, yeah, she asked me to play at her party. Amazing. That was my I first love gig. That. And then love it went it. from there, like worked in PR for a year. Um, so built up more contacts. Um, yeah. It went from it's all about community really that's it that's it yeah. isn't it it's about community with the scene and um it's the community that that really do help push you forward and help accelerate mm. you know i know definitely part of my career is you know my my music community my, my community of friends in the industry have definitely kind of, yeah we give each other opportunities and 
uh, and that in itself is joyful as well. You get to kind of have totally. a good time. With yeah, the totally. You care about, you know, you've got totally. you like your crew, you know, so. Yeah, and you want to when you when you all share the same passion, you want to see them enjoy it as much as you do yeah. and do well as well. So it's like, yeah, come and do this. Yeah, totally. We're brilliant, wonderful. Um, and so yeah, and Paulette yourself. I mean, you you know, you kind of mentioned before how you uh, you always wanted to be an entertainer. Yeah. Um, flight of flight. Obviously, you you came through the kind of the radio route, um, and then obviously did your first party in that. What was your um, your, your journey. My journey, my trajectory. Well, to start with, I um, I started off in radio when I was 18. I was like a junior reporter on the radio programme and I was sure that that, that was what I was going to do. But it didn't, I didn't kind of, I lasted kind of two years there and then I was like, worked in the record library at the radio station, but I just couldn't find my groove in the radio station and then I began singing in bands and I sang in bands for I don't know, maybe it was probably four years and you know pub circuit you know a couple of a few good gigs I, I remember my band which was we were just singing like Stevie Wonder covers and like really you know love it <laughs> <laughs> disco covers and that kind of thing and and um <clears throat> Gil Scott Heron and oh um, wow we did one gig with Curtis Mayfield which was just like yeah. oh, you know uh, I don't even know how we got those gigs to be honest but we did it <laughs> and it was a, it was a thing it was a, it was definitely good and then um I sang in studios for a long time doing backing vocal sessions, this, that and the other. And I never planned to be a DJ, but I was always buying music. I'd, I've been buying music since I've been like really little, like seven and eight of my first, you know, the first singles I remember getting. And then 11, by the time I was 11, I was using my spends to buy records. So I'd built up quite a big record collection and I was going out all the time on the scene um and i became known as a bit of a face around manchester i was dancing in a club called the number one club and i used to dance like two nights a week i was absolutely ripped like <laughs> <laughs> um, but we were like 19 <laughs> and then because i was known on the scene some <laughs> asked me if I wanted to DJ at their party because they'd run out of money and um, they couldn't afford to book a proper DJ and they'd heard that I had records. They didn't even care what records I had. I mean, it, 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 it was such a hodgepodge mix, but she, you know, she said, do you want a DJ? I'll, um, you'll DJ from nine till two and I'll give you 30 quid. And it was like 1992. So um, that was quite a lot of money then. So I was just like, yeah, you know, I was at university at the time. So I was like, yeah, 30 quid, that's like money in the bag. Wild. And then I spent a load of money. I think I spent 150 quid on records. And, <laughs> it's um, always the way every time. <laughs> yeah, like, doesn't matter how money. little money you're getting, you'll spend <laughs> way more. <laughs> so, let me get this right. Let me just, you won't even play all of them during that gig. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just backtrack. Let me backtrack a second. So in 1992, 30 pounds was a lot of money, right? It was. And you were happy to get paid that. And then you spent 150 pounds <laughs> yeah. in my 1992. Grand. I spent my grant on records. Yeah, yeah. I spent wow. grant on records. But it was worth it, you know. I just had this <laughs> sense and the feeling that it was going to be a good thing to do. And it was, in fact, a good investment because from that party, we were spotted by the people that were putting on the flesh party at the Hacienda. And the girl that ran the party at the number one that I was DJing at, she approached the people that were taking the party to the Hacienda and said, can we host your second room? And they said, yes. So I went from never having DJed before, but buying lots of records to DJing and hosting the second room of one of the most iconic parties in Manchester for four wow. years. And that's how it happened then? That's how it happened, yeah. <laughs> 
That's how it happens. That's insane. Like time, place, all the chips fell in the right way. I mean, in a way, it didn't fall in the right way because I was married at the time and I was splitting up from my husband and all sorts of things were going wrong and I was studying and I was started to do a TV show and everything was all just sort of up in the air. But DJing just brought it all together and it was the place where I found my, I think, you know, I very much found a very strong and solid identity for myself. So that's how it happened for me. And then from the Hacienda, because people were coming from all over the country to come to this party. So um, the owners and promoters of the Zap Club in Brighton saw me DJing at the Hacienda and they offered me a residency at the Zap Club in Brighton. Oh, wow. Saturday night so I went from the Hacienda to the Zap um, and I moved from Manchester to London because of the residency I had at the Zap and then the people that were running the party at Heaven the garage party at Heaven were also at Flesh they saw me perform and they offered me dates at Garage at Heaven so everything really started at that party Wow, amazing. And but for you then, obviously having been such a huge part of that's the Manchester scene in, in Hacienda, and then essentially, you know, um you're not really you have you weren't included in any of the no. books on the scene no. and, and that like <laughs> oh yeah, how how's that that been for you? Because you were a huge part of that scene. Um well at first, I was like, I'd think, well, you know, maybe they'll correct it at the next reprint. You know, you always kind of say to yourself, well, maybe they've just forgotten or it's been edited out or, you know, there's still, there's always that chance that someone's just made a mistake and they'll correct it. But then more and more, what happens is that the more books that come out on this subject, they use a particular set of books about the Hacienda for the reference so then the omission just gets bigger yeah, and, yeah, bigger yeah. and bigger because if you miss it in this book then every single other book and film and documentary and interview will also miss it so you know by 2015 when I came back to Manchester I was just like this has to be corrected because now it's gone from being a tiny little oops we've forgotten to a massive big hole in the, you know in history me, hole in the history because <laughs> it wasn't one book that I'd forgotten it was all of the books that I've forgotten so um yeah and it wasn't just me you know it's not just my history it's like Hugh and Clark again a black DJ who started the Hacienda alongside Dave Haslam, alongside Mike Pickering, and they never talk about him. You know, it's like a cursory two sentences and then that's all they wrong. talk about. But at the beginning of the Hacienda, when black people used to go a lot, mm. they went to listen to Hugh and Clark. I went to listen to Hugh and Clark. You know, it's it, <laughs> and why, why do you think, um, Two questions actually is how how the, what's the journey been like in terms of getting your name into the history book now and the other question I have is um, why did black people stop going? Um, I think <laughs> there, there were lots of reasons why people black people stopped going in the original I think the original reason just was that the rave music wasn't for them you know it, it was like this real schism it, it's not so, even so much the rave you, you had the Manche mad chester thing that was happening at the same yeah. time you know oasis and spiral carpets that kind of, and that music just wasn't for that crowd yeah. you know yeah. the jazz defectors stopped going and like all these different groups of people that were, were the dancers they stopped going and the ravers took over so there was a musical shift which is normal you know it's cycles but um it was i think firstly in part it was to do with hugh and stop djing there so his crowd stopped going i think they left 
and then the music changed so right. lots of other black people stopped going because the music wasn't really for them and um, then you know which the thing that is really well documented is the gang wars that kind of yeah. really told the death knoll for the hacienda and you know that had a lot to do with it as well so yeah those were the i i think those are the three main reasons why people stopped going um why did and i in terms of, yeah in terms of in terms of you then and, and and being able to kind of write your you know your name back in the history books how have you been able to do that you know what's that journey because i think you're still on that journey yeah i am um, still i am still on that journey and um but i'm trying not to make the journey too much about me now because i think that my story has been told but what i want to use it for is that nobody else that follows me no matter what club they work for if they think they've got a place in it make sure that your story is told make sure that you have your place and if you see that your place is missing when these people are talking about it it's time to start saying something so i'm just hoping that i inspire people to say hey you know that happened to me <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Got, scream the loudest now, keep screaming got, we've got the talking stick now so yeah. we can yes. <laughs> you know, we've got, yeah. fine it's okay for us <laughs> now and i think you know part of my journey as well is that i was terrified in 2015 when i came back i knew it was something that i had to do but i was really scared about doing it because what it represents in terms of the work is that if you piss people off too much if you you know if you upset people and make them think you know by making the public think that their books are factually incorrect or their math mm -hmm. is factually incorrect you know people won't want to employ me so i was kind of scared thinking i might never work again i've always had that i mean it's a really stupid phrase but if you want to make an omelette you've got to break some eggs and if you want to you know if you want to change something Sometimes you have to do that thing that, you know, you have to sacrifice absolutely mm. everything in order to, first of all, make that change possible, make that change possible for everybody else. It's not just for me, you know, I'm like, I'm 53, you know, when, so when I started in on this, I was like 49, it was my 50th birthday and I was like, God, you know, I, I've come this far, I have got to use all this knowledge, I've got to use all this experience to make it easier for anybody else that's coming up, yeah, coming up underneath <laughs> me. Because I don't want, you know, if my nieces were to start DJing, I want them to have an easier life than I did with it. I want them to benefit from changes that we, as women in the black women in the music industry can make i want them to benefit from um you know the experience that we will then feed back into the system and so that that my kind of utopian um idea about why i was doing you know why i'm doing and why i have done what i've done is really just to be a little bit Joan of Arc with it and you know stand there with a standard <laughs> going, you know, votes for women. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget us, you know, because it isn't, it isn't just me, you know. I know that or not probably I know, I don't know, maybe 70% of the DJs that I started working with in the 90s are in exactly the same position as me and we've all had to really say we were there women got written out of rave mm. black women definitely were yeah. written out of the yeah. industry and it's like you know all history we live in a patriarchal society. You only need to think about Christopher Columbus and, you know, think about all the explorers, Vasco da Gama, Chris, Christopher Columbus. You'd be hard pressed to think about a woman who'd done anything useful 
in history. And then you start to think it's like, oh yeah, yeah, Florence Nightingale and penicillin and you know suffragettes. And actually, women did do something, and we really did do something. But every single discipline, women have got to fight and fight hard yeah. to be given their place. You know, we like being told that you've got to earn your place when men can just like stroll in and it's really yeah. easy. Yeah. And um, I just thought I'm prepared to take people on because you know, stupidly I thought, how can you get less work than none? Well, actually, you can get, <laughs> <laughs> you can get no work forever or you can get no work now. <laughs> you know, no work this year or no work for the next time. I, I just, you know, I'm hard to throw a, you know, spin the roulette wheel on that one and think I'm prepared to take that risk. I am prepared mm. to take that risk because I am prepared to fight this on a political level. It's not about me anymore. This is politics. This is like sexual politics. This is identity politics. This is cultural politics. This is heritage. It's everything. It's history. It's just like baseline history. Like women black women get written out of history all the time yeah and i'm not having it anymore you know yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no we're not you know, <laughs> i'm just not having it anymore and it doesn't need to happen and all it takes is for the writer to write one little sentence and there's no battle mm. you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Really, it's that simple yeah and yet if they're gonna make a point and this is why this was the real crux of why I took on this battle is that when I came back to Manchester, I read the Peter Hook book again. And I think the first time I'd read it, um, I wasn't really taking it in. And at the end, the, the last section of the book, he makes a particular note of detailing every single party that was run through the Hacienda, every single one, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, which DJs played, how much money was made, blah, 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 blah. And on every single lineup for Flesh, he notes a DJ that did not play every month. And I, you know, I love Luke Howard, he's a really good friend of mine. I played with him many, many times at Flesh, but he did not play every month. I did. Luke Howard's from London. Mm. I'm from Manchester. Yeah. That room was mine. I hosted it every month for four years and I did not get one single credit or mention in the book. And that was what wow. made my head explode. That was the point where I just thought, this is, this is bullshit now. Mm. Yeah, that's that's political because it's that's political now, that's isn't it? Now yeah, political. yeah. He made a choice. He, he chose not to put your name spoke about, mm. and he didn't put my name on it. And it's not like my name was missing from the posters. My name is on every single flyer and poster, every single one. He couldn't have missed it, so he's made an that's actual true. choice not to name me and mm. to name someone who isn't on the flyers. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. If he'd, if he'd named somebody else that was playing in that room at the time, fair enough. But when he's naming someone that didn't actually play at all those parties, then I have a problem. Mm. So that's why I did it. It, it. You know, the first one was, at the first instance it was, I'm going to put this right for me. And then it's the second instance, it was like, I'm going to put this right for the people that played at the Hacienda. Then I, it was like, I'm going to put this right for the gay people that played at the Hacienda because they don't make anything of the gay party. And then it was like the women that work there who also weren't mentioned. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. It's like, mm. I kept fighting, you know, I kept kind of taking on another battle. And how I did it was I found a writer who found the story interesting and we I mean it started off as a tiny little piece in the skinny and then it went 
from the skinny to the independent to the times to the guardian to the and it just went everywhere the nice. women that rave forgot the women that you know ageism in clubbing sexism in clubbing and it, it was just at that time which was the you know luckily or unluckily for some people it hit the 100th anniversary of the suffragette movement oh, which wow. was started in manchester so it was all became like really fiercely political and mm. i'm glad it did because it, it it made the right noise in order for them to start listening again and mm. you know this year i started playing for the hacienda again which is great you know they've actually you know accepted me into the fold which is like yes fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know it has had a result i'm not working i'm not not working for a hundred years so it was worth taking the risk but it was also worth taking the risk because it's made enough noise for people to start you know thinking about diversity and inclusion and mm -hmm. properly thinking about diversity and inclusion and how they talk about their clubs and the club's history and going forward what they're going to do with it so you know it's not saying that i'm the only one that's making the noise there's many more people as well but that's how it's worked for me so mm. it's um it's nice for me to hear you talking about this paulette because obviously I'm, i've known who you are for a long time um but also um i really related to it because you spoke about it in your recent dj mag yeah. um, piece that you yeah. did with ans yes um, and i really related to it like a few years ago or maybe a little bit longer i could almost see myself being erased from drum and bass before my eyes yeah. i was thinking hold on a second am i going mad or yeah. is this actually happening yeah. like and everything that i yeah everything that i'd achieved it was never enough for some people to continue booking me even yeah. though there were men constantly being booked who had achieved as much or maybe not quite yeah. as much but they're allowed to keep rolling off of that that older legacy whereas yeah. as a woman and particularly a black woman you have to constantly be proving yourself absolutely in that you're worth booking that you're worth being asked to do anything absolutely um and then just just articles that were coming out that were about women in drum and bass and i was very rarely asked for them at this particular point and i was thinking hold on a second what's going on like yeah i would at one point i was arguably well, I was one of the best known women in drum and bass. I had a show on the BBC weekly for five years. Um, I was running, doing all this other stuff. And I was thinking, hold on, why, why is happened? this being forgotten about? Like, yeah. what happened? I was there, I was a resident at Swerve, but my name isn't always mentioned in that respect. Obviously it was Fabio's night. Doesn't but matter. I played regularly and I was there every week as yeah. well. Like, I don't know, just, yeah, just all these things started adding up. And I thought, hold on a second, like, I need to do something about this. Um, and then I had to slow down a little bit because I had some health issues and had to take time off work and step back from bookings a little bit. But then when I started feeling better, um, I thought, okay, so I need to take a last shot at this. And if I don't do it now, then I'm just going to exactly. kind of fade away into exactly. oblivion into nothing. Yeah. So I fought really hard and um, fought really hard and did like, made sure that I did specific guest guest slots on specific radio shows and just really pushed myself out there. Um, was doing my podcast and yeah, just other things. And then when the EQ50 thing, I really threw myself into that when we kind of, when we co-founded that and working with some really great women who are all passionate and all have um, a lot of experience behind them. Like we've all been working in music circles for a long time each. Um, yeah, so I've, yeah, I've really had to make it kind of pick up for myself again because yep. nobody else was going to no, do it. Yeah. You, nobody else would do it. it. And you said that phrase as well, which is like, it's so hard hanging on to the joy of music yeah. when there is a battle, it's like a political battle, because no matter what you do, it's not enough. Yeah. It's, like, it's so hard, like, at first it's like there's a clock ticking on you 
actors, you know, music has become incredibly young and yeah. to be able to keep your footing in music, it's like going back to, you know, why isn't it about the, you know, why have, where have all the black people gone? Because mm. we kind of, kind of got older in the game. Yeah. And most of the black people now are either into grime or they're into drill or they're into yeah. R and and you know but do you think that's because do you think that's also because they don't realise that it's it the, the the history behind it because I've had you know I had plenty yeah. of black friends growing up saying to me, why are you into white music? I'm like yeah, Sorry, I think can, that's can you not hear the soul, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's yeah, definitely part yeah, of the reason. Yeah, it's part yeah. of the reason and if and where where I guess, like you say, Paulette, the black people who are involved in house or drum and bass or techno or whatever are getting older, you're not seeing the newer names come through yeah, so no. much. So the younger people aren't seeing themselves. Yeah. And because, that's that's part of it. Because at both ends you've been kind of pushed out. Yeah. You're kind of not big enough to come through and you're too uh, and again you're not big enough to go through to the yeah. next level so you hit the right. ceiling hit the ceiling and you're not kind yeah. of it's contained in this kind of like middle ground of nothing happening where they're kind of quite happy for us to be and then the cheaper ones that will do it for nothing and then the <laughs> ones that want a hundred grand they're the ones that they'll use and it's it's really difficult being able to hold on to the joy of music pass on that kind of um pass it on pass on everything you know bring and try and bring other people up when these are the uh, you know these are the barriers to what you need to do in order in order to encourage that flow you know how can you bring other people up when you're actually being prevented yeah, yeah. That's, that is yeah, yeah and that exactly. is the battle i think for a lot of a lot of um, black people and people of color within the creative industries it's like you know the the struggle the constant struggle between wanting like you said to to kind of help and create space but then you know I, i'm i'm just about hanging I here by the spread yeah. myself yeah. you yeah, know yeah, yeah. I, 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 you know and so there is there's that internal battle and i've definitely felt that myself you know over the years and stuff and thankfully i'm now hitting a position where i can bring people up but i had to it it felt like i was not turning my back but you know, in that way where you're like, you know, I, I've actually because of the way the system works, I've got to like keep my head down and can go, 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 and then I can start building, creating my own table. And I think that's the thing that I feel, especially with like the, the younger generation and my generation, is like the everyone feels like they're trying to build their own table now, rather mm -hmm. than saying, "Oh, can I get through your door, please?" Or yeah. you know, yeah. we're actually we're crying because because of advocate, because, but that's because of accessibility though. You know, obviously the internet and social media is meant that things are much more easily accessible than they were, you know, when, when you both were kind of coming up and, and, and the people before you were coming up and that. Um, See, that's the other thing as well for me. Um, when I came up, there was no precedent. You know, there wasn't another, really, there wasn't another woman in Manchester terms that was the influence on me that could show me what to yeah. do or how to do it or you know, the, and even you know i was talking to greg wilson the other day and he made that point there was no precedent for a female dj who'd made a career out of it there were a few female djs but they were like hobbyists you know they weren't full-time career djs like i went on to be you know, I'm, I had to move to London in order to do really what I wanted to do. And, you know, maybe if I hadn't moved, it, it wouldn't have been that same. It wouldn't have been the same, but you do need kind of mentors and, yeah. you know, people that can hold, you know, not baby mind you, but can handhold you through the process or can guide you through some of the processes and just help you with a little bit of information. 
you know, I didn't even know what to do with my reaction sheets at the beginning. You know, it's like, who do I send all these to? <laughs> I, I used to photocopy them all and send them to everybody, you know, so they don't of every single reaction from East West, Sony, Columbia, <laughs> and everyone would get like a pack of all my reactions a week. I was clueless. I was clueless when I started out. I didn't know what to do. No one told me what to do. Mm. So, you know, there's another thing where I feel like I can, um, you know, pass on my joy with it because, you know, it's yeah. funny, you know, looking back at it, it's funny, but I can give that really basic advice i can give that to everybody and yeah. it's fun it's fun it's fun it's fun really it's not brain surgery is it mm. no. <laughs> i think just... i think that there hasn't been enough mentoring in general no. like i think back to when i was first coming through and yeah i kind of obviously chemistry and storm like helped me with my big break getting in with metalheads um and unfortunately kemi died in the accident I before that. before I played there for the first time so um yeah I've always kind of got that in the back of my mind but um yeah I think I think it kind of links in with everything and how music and the industry and the scenes have moved in general is there hasn't haven't been enough mentors mentee situations um to kind of let people know how things have been done mm -hmm. so they can either choose to do that or go in a completely different direction, you know? Um, so it would be nice to see a lot more of that taking Absolutely. place. Um, I, I still need one, so, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really, I would not say no. I would not say no. We all you want your DM start blowing up now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, just kind of going a little bit back towards, um, you know, joy on the dance floor and um, and how it's kind of expressed, and just uh, I suppose like expanding on that. And you both have talked about, uh, you know, your love of radio and kind of, um, and especially coming up through radio, especially with Make Yourself Fly. Um, you know, you you work on on you know the with Prison Radio Association, um, which I think is just incredible and i'd love for you just to talk to us a bit about that and how that is another expression of joy Absolutely. um so when i started there it was just i had applied for just a little i think it was like a six month internship um at the time so it was it was a little while after i'd um lost my one extra show and my bookings dropped off quite a bit um, I started working in Black Market, BM Soho. I worked there for, I think, a few years, maybe five years. I can't remember. Um, but it was getting to the point where I needed something else financially because um, I wasn't earning enough to cover all of my bills and blah, blah, blah. It was turning into a little bit of a mess. Anyway, I saw this job advertised. I'd, um, I was back on Rinse FM at that point because I first played on Rinse in the late 90s when it was a pirate still. So like 98. 99 2000 kind of times um and while i was on rinse i started working as a broadcast assistant just helping out on a couple of shows a week um but that was unpaid so i thought okay i need to make some money somehow saw this job advertised and it was like yeah prison radio association six months come and help change people's lives um i can't remember the exact wording but i thought i'm gonna go for it i've got a bit of ba um ba experience now and I went for it, had an interview and got the job. And I'm still there seven years later. I'd never expected to be there this long. But when I initially saw it, I thought, OK, it's radio. I could maybe use my radio background and experience to give them advice and stuff. Wasn't exactly sure how it would work. I'd never set foot in a prison before. I went even to have my... Um, yeah, even before I started, I'd never stepped into a prison before never knew anyone personally that had been to prison never visited anyone in prison so it was a whole new experience and to be honest i was shitting myself <laughs> the first time i went into brixton because i was like oh am i going to see all the prisoners and are they going to be really dangerous and oh i just didn't know what to expect um but my colleagues all really cool they're all really passionate about radio and have worked for the bbc and commercial stations and all that kind of stuff and the guys we work with so we've got 
we've got a project in Brixton Prison, and then there's one in Style, which is just outside Manchester. And Paula actually recorded yeah. a show for us that went out right. last oh, last right. year. Black yeah. Hacienda. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, fantastic. I'm um, check it out. And uh, it's just really rewarding work, you know? Um, it just, I guess it was kind of, it allows me to continue in radio, which I finally realised is a passion of mine and mm. one of the most important things in my life. Mm but it's also really rewarding watching people progress. So some of the guys that we've had work for us in Brixton, they were at real low points when they started. Um, there used to be a radio production course, but that got cut um, a few years ago now. Um, but just seeing how they blossom, like they could be quite introverted. Um, they can be themselves with us. No, numerous of them have called it a little oasis in the middle of the prison. They don't feel like they're in prison when they come into the radio station to work. They can ask for their favourite songs to be downloaded if we don't have it already on the database. They can listen to music, they're creative. They get to meet various people from all walks of life, um, famous people, people that work in criminal justice. They get to interview like the number one governor of their prison or somebody much higher up the chain like working in the prison system um we had we've had mo gilligan um Love loads that. of different people have come in loads of people have come in um trying to think who came in most recently it's all a blur we've had guys do really brilliant interviews with rennie edo lodge like she actually oh. tweeted after her visit saying that was much better than the bbc and it's one of the best <laughs> conversations i've ever had yeah. which is really nice so it's, it's just really nice watching people progress and see them realize that they are worth much more than they've been told they are by society you know like however they've ended up in prison it could be any of us we're all like a couple of paychecks or a couple of wrong decisions away from ending up inside ourselves i always say that to people um yeah it's it's um i don't know i don't feel like heartwarming is, is a strong enough descriptor but um, yeah, it's, it's, ama it's been amazing working there. It can be quite stressful at times just because of the environment, but generally we've had really <laughs> great guys and women up at Style working for us on the radio station. Okay. And it's, it's a lifeline to a lot of people. It really is. Yeah. It really it's is. amazing. No, it's absolutely brilliant. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that you do there. Um, and I'm it's also made me, oh. sorry, it's also made me a much better, presenter and producer like I am actually a producer now like when I first started there I was just kind of could do a bit of broadcast assistance like yeah I kind of know how to use the desk and that but I consider myself a proper producer now amazing so you've had your own growth from working yeah. there as well which is incredible yeah, totally and I'm interested to know as well that um I know obviously you've, you've kind of Spoke about this quite you've been very vocal about the fact that within the prison system you know black and brown people and muslims are overrepresented yeah um, and and obviously getting them involved with the uh you know, the raid prison radio has obviously brought you know some great worth to their lives um mm. and which is incredible and i just want to um i want to just discuss the parallels between black and brown people on the dance floor and kind of bringing joy to them in that way, but then being able to bring joy to them in this system, which is yeah. over-representing them and also oppressing them. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it's, 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 I do think it's wonderful and I want to just kind of explore how you feel about that. Yeah. Um, there's, there are obviously a lot of strong parallels between the two. Um, it's funny though, I don't think, sometimes we have conversations like, I produced, so George the Poet had his own show on NPR oh, for a while, it. which which I produced, yeah. and it was amazing. We got like incredible feedback, people were writing in saying, oh my God, you're changing my life. Like, I wanna do what you do, or sending in brilliant poems that they've written in their mm -hmm. cells. Um, and when he'd come in for visits to Brixton sometimes, um, what he talks about and what he asks the guys is, is basically just getting them to open up and we ended up putting this in the shows and i think a lot of people 
kind of know that something is not right in society and the way they've been living, but they don't know why. Mm. They don't know exactly how things are set up and why they've been restricted from making progress in that down that avenue or whatever. So it's really nice just to see this realization taking place. And for me personally, and a couple of my colleagues, we always make sure that when we invite guests in, ordinarily when we're in the, working in the prison and in the studio, we try and invite as many positive black people as possible, whether they serve time themselves and have made good, have got on to like set up their own business in whatever it is, or are just doing really well, become a mentor to someone or doing outreach work. Um, and just in terms of the music as well, um, it's, it's a, a very conscious thing for me that I know that black people were heavily overrepresented within the criminal, I don't even like calling it criminal justice system, mm -hmm. criminal punishment system, <laughs> a woman in America <laughs> that, I know, uh, that I follow <laughs> on Twitter, that's what she calls it, the criminal punishment system. Um, so yeah, I've constantly got that in the back of my mind is, okay, I'm playing to the, I'm selecting songs for these people because they probably need, everybody in prison needs support, but these people need a little bit more nurturing, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a constant thing, but it's also really heartbreaking to know that the last time the stats were tallied for youth offenders. So the number, the total number of young offenders inside had come down. I think this was maybe last year. Um, but the number of black and mixed young people in prison, mostly boys, had gone up and they were over half of the total wow. YO population, wow. which is absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Because yeah. once once you're into that, yeah, once you're in, it's quite hard to get out. Wow. Mm -hmm. So to know that a lot of young people are being trapped mm -hmm. into this way of life and into this system and this cycle is, yeah, it's a bit much. Mm. it's a bit much and yeah. that's that's a big part of the reason that I've stayed there for so long I think because I don't know yeah me and one colleague in particular my friend Muna she's a brilliant producer as well she's black she's Muslim um yeah we just know that we need to be there <laughs> yeah we need to be there it's a and I think it becomes a vocation then doesn't it yeah, like, um, yeah. you bring joy it's like you Paula so it's like you, you know, you're we, we, with you. You've been passionate about making sure that you're screaming the loudest, so that people coming up don't have to do go through what mm. you went through. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, but yeah, it's like what you're doing is you're trying to make sure that people are nurtured and looked after, and, and you're saying that I see you. Yeah, you know, and, and um, representation, yeah. representation, representation. Totally. And it's interesting because I've been really, you know, I get these moments where I get really heartened by, you know, either a, a little note someone will leave on my Instagram or my Twitter. And, um, you know, one of the women that I met um, in the style, um, you know, she's out now and she sent me a message saying, oh, you know, do you remember us? We made this program and I'm still in radio and, you know, I listen to your Amazing. show every month. And, you so much for coming in I'm gonna wow. come and it's just like this is why we do it you know mm. if one person is inspired or feels that kind of you know connection and that joy and feels that hope that you know no matter what happens you know you can it, it's a battle everything in life is a battle but you can get through it you know and there are people mm. that are there with their like yeah, yeah, arms yeah, yeah. outstretch to you know catch you kind of this is what we're here for you know I've not had kids but you don't have to have kids to have a family you know and that's yeah, that of course. yeah. anyone that follows me with music it's like families tribes isn't it mm. yeah. and it makes all the difference and, you know like once I think society forgets <laughs> people once they've gone to prison Totally. Um, and people in prison know that they're forgotten about. They know that the media doesn't really talk yeah. about it unless it's all the negative stories, mm -hmm. people with cameras on the wing and doing whatever. Um, so it makes all the difference when guests do come in, whether 
it's in person or by phone. It really does make a lot of difference. And I want to also touch on um, what you do with EQ50 as well, because that's about representation and diversity. Um, yeah. You know, on a you know a different a different point, but yeah, talk to me a bit about about EQ50. Everyone would yeah, so, hear about it. So basically, we set up EQ50. So there's a crew of us. There's a crew of us women. It's me, Mantra, who runs Rupture, the club night, and Label with her partner Double O. Um, Chickaboo is an organising member, legendary MC, the first ever jungle MC, toured with Soul to Soul for years, has done loads of stuff, hit the charts with T-My Mass, she's, she's brilliant, I love her, she's so good. Um, Jenna G's actually just become a recent organising member, and Sweet P, um, she's been around for maybe 10 years, um, and has released music on Med School and Dispatch and some other labels. Um, so we're the core organising members of the crew. Um, it was basically set up because we're all kind of fed up of not enough women being supported in drum and bass. It's been nice to see more coming through in the last few years, but that's mainly thanks to the internet and social media and um, with streaming becoming more of a thing, home streaming, it's a lot easier for people to just jump on Facebook and play some tunes or whatever. Um, actually, Block to Block in Manchester have featured quite a lot of women DJs on their platform. So, yeah, there are more women getting out there, but in terms of reaching the higher level, there still hasn't been enough. Um, a couple of years ago, Mantra put some stats together, looking at a few of the biggest labels and parties, and she tallied up the number of events that they had in the UK that year, as many as she could find, and counted how many women were booked on each event. The percentages were shocking. <laughs> really yeah, shocking. Yeah, zero. Really, zero. just zero. really, really low. Yeah, there was like some sets, but no more than 10 sets in a whole year of events. Um, Ten. Apart Ten. Well, most of them were less than that, to be honest. Um, they, they obviously had more. She included Rupture in that, and they had more, but there was still a way to go for them to book more than there were. Um, then we did a Normal Not Novelty drum and bass special with Red Bull. That went really yeah. well. And we just thought, you know what, it would be nice to do something ourselves within drum and bass, not having to rely on another organisation. Um, to put it on for us. So yeah, we came together and EQ50 was born. Then we had our first event at Five Miles in North London um, hey. at the end of 2018. And that was an afternoon session on a Saturday. And we had um, Mantra and Jin did a promotion, a promoter session. So just telling people what they need to think about and organize if they want to promote a night. Uh, we had a production session where Kay from Untouchables was teaching people how to make beats. Um, myself and Storm did a DJ Q&A and then we played back to back as well and then we had a panel, an industry panel where women could send in their tunes ahead and they would get played and receive feedback from the panel. A bunch of women that have been working in the industry. And then our second event <clears throat> was last year at Fabric and I hosted a panel about being a black woman in drum and bass and dance music and had Chickaboo, Robin Chaos and Sherelle. That was amazing. We all really loved it. <laughs> like none of us have had the opportunity to talk like that before in front of an audience. Um, and it's actually been quite m much more recent over the last couple of years that I've actually played on um, lineups with all black women. So Babes London booked me for a carnival boiler room that they did that was all black women. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This has never happened in drum yeah, bass before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, babes and babes. Yeah. Pussy Palace. Yeah. 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 And, then, um, yeah. and then Josie Rebel booked, booked me for her party last <laughs> yeah. year at Pickle Factory. And actually there was one black man on the lineup, Cleveland Watkiss, who's an absolute legend yeah. of jazz yeah. and music. Um, yeah. So... I don't know, it just feels like there's more momentum for this kind of mm -hmm. stuff to be happening now. Um, and we wanted to start, we wanted to launch our mentorship last year, but because we've all got loads of other commitments, it just got a bit hectic. And then with uh, coronavirus, everyone in quarantine, people being furloughed, 
then just seeing the civil rights uprising, um, particularly after with George Floyd um, and Breonna Taylor, that kind of set in light to things globally. We thought, okay, now, I said, now is the time that we need to yeah. get this mentorship finished. It's the right time. People are taking more notice of social issues. Um, like it's not the general hustle and bustle people working um, and going out at the weekend and just being able to kind of ignore or it's slipping through the net kind of like people are watching and they're ready for this. So we went for it and we've got um, Ram records, Shogun audio, critical V recordings and function digitals label all on board. And um, yeah, the, we, we had an amazing response. We're about to go through all the applications over the next couple of weeks to find our shortlist. But yeah, yeah. so we'll, ha we'll have five, five women work, each working with one of our partner labels for a year. Great. That's so exciting. That's so exciting. I absolutely love that. I love that. Um, yeah, it's just, it's brilliant. Brilliant about EQ50. For me, you know, I, I think Josie was actually probably the first black female techno DJ that I ever saw right um and I remember uh it was it's funny it was an ex-boyfriend of mine and he was like oh you're really gonna love this, this chick to Josie Rebel you know like he put on the, he put on a, a party in Hackney Wick years ago and um and I was like oh okay cool I didn't really you know I didn't know anything about her at the time and he didn't um he didn't actually even tell me she was black or anything because I know she, she's really great she just started on Rins yeah. and I was like, okay, sweet. And then I saw her and I remember just like knocking everyone out of the way. <laughs> and just like marching to the front and standing there and being like, what? <laughs> and just like, just literally just dancing in the front there. And then, uh, yeah. And I remember, remember from that day on, we, we always stayed in contact from, from then on. And there is that thing, isn't there? Because it's like, oh my God, you're like me. And yeah. Yeah. you like the thing yeah, that I exactly. like. And there's no yeah. one else really here. Yeah. Like, it looks like, you know, and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and you know it's a beautiful thing and now we're here at a point where you know yourself you you, you both of you have been through that you know tenfold and and now you're in a position you know where you're doing mentorship programs and stuff that's amazing and and, and Paula you're rewriting the history books you know um both of you are like really coming full circle and and, and you know utilizing this time especially so that and to inspire the rest of us to, to yeah. utilize the time um, yeah. and, and to kind of put our foot down. And like you're saying, we've got the talking stick now. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm only going to pass it to other black women and other black yes. people. That's it. Other, you know, other, other black people of different orientations, you know, tra black trans people. Black, like, literally, that's it. That's all. That's, the only people who are getting the talking stick are black. That's it. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, you know, you know, and especially if they're women. Here you go. <laughs> exactly. We can, we can talk. People have realised we have a voice. People yeah. are now listening. That's that's yeah. the thing. You know, they can't yeah. they can't tune us out anymore. The right. noise is too loud. They they it's too loud. Yeah. It's too loud. Whatever you want to do, it's time. But always, you know like balancing out the trauma because we all have had this collective deep trauma everyone yeah. has this collective deep trauma and you know the realizations and the flashbacks and the, the you know the triggers it's all like coming to the surface and it helps to balance that with the joy of yeah. it and and you know whether that's in taking pictures or writing poems or playing music and coming to we can't come together but we can experience it online and we can have some kind of collective joyful experience of ourselves as you know just powerful creative and talented black women and that is just Sick. Yeah. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> Sick. Yeah. No, it's great. It's great. It's allowed. It allows you know. It's allowed. It's brought us together. You yeah. Know? Um. And and I'm. I feel very very fortunate. I'm very fortunate about that. And you know, I love black women. That's, yeah. You know, I, 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 yeah. I, I, call me bias. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Just awesome, powerful yeah. women. 
who are so switched on. And it's like, why have I never, you know, why haven't I had this opportunity before? But you know what? Mm. I am actually really glad of it now. I'm yes. glad of it now because okay. knowing that, you know, there's someone like me and there's you and there's you and there's you. It's a, it's a, it's a reinforcement, mm. massive reinforcement. Yeah. And it gives you, it gives me the strength to do what I need to do. And if it gives me the strength to do what I need to do, then I'm pulling everyone with me while I've yeah. got it. Literally. And you know, we, there is a thing that we have that's beautiful and shining. And you know, we see it when we see another black woman, well, yeah. you know, I, there's a, and you yeah. can't replicate yeah. that. And you, I can't even really describe it, but there is a thing that we all recognize within each other. Yeah. And so, it feels right now that there is a you know, real linking of arms and being like, yeah, okay, well, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. you literally cannot ignore us yeah. anymore. You, there'll be no writing us out of the history book because we have things mm. like Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. There and, you go. You know, yeah. That literally, the minute it gets printed, it's getting tweeted about oh. up there. So yeah. you know, <laughs> that, you know? Yeah. 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 careers yeah. are ended on Twitter. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But then things are also blossomed, you know, through <clears> social media as well. So. Um, yeah, I just want to, um, you know, to kind of wrap up. I think this has been like such a wonderful conversation. Um, I feel so fortunate to have with you both and I to reinforce. I feel fortunate joy. as well. Why well, can I, I feel fortunate? <laughs> oh, no. You know, and I, I do. I want to end on on that that um, you know the, the theme of joy and to find joy within your circles. And you know, it's so important. Find joy within your communities mm. and whatever. You know, it has to be electronic music or you know whatever community that you're part of you know it's important to define the joy because you know we don't we don't we love dancing okay <laughs> we, we love dancing we're dancing on our yeah. own we're dancing you know I, i'm always doing bedroom dance things like during the lockdown i was like i'll dance in the dance rock my bedroom's a dance rock great yeah. let's get you know in my head um, this is it don't worry about my play isolation playlist now <laughs> <laughs> you know and and you know it's it's important for us as well to be able especially when the world around us is is trying attempting to pull us down and tell us mm -hmm. that we don't we're not right for a b c and d yeah. you know, as you touched on earlier we've all had to deal with those that trauma and it it comes up and it's hard to deal with and we get through it but if we've got the joy there to kind of always be able to tap into we know that you know okay we're going through this trauma but we've also got this incredible pool to tap into yeah exactly yeah exactly you know. it's not saying that the trauma doesn't exist but <clears throat> you oh. know we're shoulder to shoulder like you said we're, link we're linking arms i'm feeling the like presence of the network and the link and yeah. the, every place i see that shining you know that that soul that spirit that shining is shining so brightly now and what i would say is just let the light shine We've spent too long. Yeah. Trying to dim dimming, mm. you know. For who's and for who's benefit really? There's the joy. Uh, Let the light shine. If you want to dance, dance. If you want to sing, sing. Just go for it. Go for 100%. it. Hundred percent. Amazing. Indeed. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you much. For us. Okay, we will dance together again. Yes. yes we will. We will. One hundred percent. I did, I'm. i honestly. I'm gonna. I'm gonna hold you to that. I'm gonna That's actually cool. hold you to that one. Okay. That yes, is for sure. Thing. That really yeah. is. You know, my joys in life: music, dancing, food, and you know, my family. <laughs> well, but. Music, dancing, food, music, dancing, food, music, dancing, food, and dancing for me is just, you know, people will see me go and drop a scissor kick. It's like, how old are you again? <laughs> I need to see that. I we need to get out of front. I need to see the scissor kick. Like, what? Uh, uh, I can't even do a scissor kick. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, I said to myself when I was younger that when I stop doing cartwheels, I will stop, you know, doing <laughs> DJ. I can still do a cartwheel followed by an Irish bring and a flick flap. So there you go. Really? Um, you know, in a well, flick. Uh, <laughs> so, an inspiration to us all. Uh, <laughs> like, absolute stop. inspiration. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Thank you both so much. I'm going to shout out obviously your Instagrams as well. Uh, yeah. DJ Klein, what tell me your, to what your what socials are you on? Where can everyone find you both? 
Flight. Let's go with you first. Um, so Twitter at DJ Flight, Instagram at DJ Flight, Facebook Flight.DJ. Got my own website, djflight.co.uk. I don't update as often as I should, but I will. Same. <laughs> 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 like, where can we find you? Twitter slash DJ Paulette. Um, Instagram, DJ underscore Paulette one. Mixcloud, DJ Paulette. Soundcloud, DJ Paulette. And Facebook slash DJ Paulette. Right, yeah. so everyone, and I am an absolute demon. I am not meticulous, but I'm pretty much every day on the so pretty much every day on Twitter and Facebook and in Instagram, maybe a little bit less because I don't like taking pictures of myself. I think that's a bit weird. Me neither. But I really I just, don't enjoy photos. I, I just photos taken. really, really bad <laughs> selfies. I, just, I think I look nice, and then I look at the picture and I look really horrible. So I just prefer. Not <laughs> Yeah, that's I'm fair enough. That's with other people, but I'm really good with words. So you'll find me on okay. Twitter and Facebook, and I'm really good with music. And I've got radio shows and everything. So Mixcloud and Soundcloud are there, and they don't. And I've got a website which is djpaulette.co.uk, and everything's on there. Amazing, amazing. Thank oh, and you. I will add Go one more. Sorry. Go for it. If anybody wants to listen to my Windrush Stories podcast, it's on Please. Apple, iTunes, Spotify, most um, podcast providers. Just search Go. Windrush Stories. And my sister did the artwork. Big up, Abby. Oh, I'm going to listen. Yeah, so it was a bit of a family project. <laughs> I love this. I love this. I, um, I actually did a, a Windrush um, uh, mix special actually for, for Jazz FM. Oh, um, cool. Uh, I'll send it to you so you can like it. Yeah. Yes, please. Do. by my grandparents. Yeah. Ah, wicked. Um, yeah, please send yeah. it. I'd love to listen to that. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you both so much. So, just you want to reiterate, we want to reiterate again to everyone who's at home there's no excuse to not follow these two amazing women. DJ Fly and yourself, DJ Paulette, and, my, uh, and myself. Oh, yeah, you can follow me at Miss Lou Jasmine. I'm Miss Lou Jasmine pretty much on every platform. Um, and I, uh, my website is uh, loujasmine.com. You can follow me too. Um, and yeah, just a huge thank you to guys from everyone we out here with Sam from Sam Wax as well. Um, and to everyone at home who's been watching, thank you so much for thank taking you. the time and, and sticking with us. It's been, it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, and for anyone who um, who's missed the broadcast, um, missed it live, you'll be able to check back pretty soon. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. So, so Yay! Bye. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 <laughs>